why we age and how to slow or reverse the effects of aging is not the normal and natural consequence that we all will suffer, but rather that aging is a disease that can be slowed or halted. Any of us, indeed all of us, can slow or reverse the effects of aging. You're going to learn a tremendous amount of information and you're going to learn both the mechanistic science behind reversing the aging process and practical tools that you can apply in your everyday life. Why is it that having elevated glucose and insulin ages us more quickly? And or why is it that having periods of time each day or perhaps longer can extend our lifespan? Let's start with, with what I think was a big mistake, was the idea that people should never be hungry. In the past, our bodies were constantly fighting disease and deterioration throughout life. Even before birth, we're fighting against entropy. Things are falling apart. The aging clock that we can now measure begins at conception. Our society is built on comfort. We've got, most countries have enough food and shelter uh, we can sit down, we don't have to run away from predators very often. And this is a real problem because these longevity defenses that normally would be activated by being cold and hungry and running are lethargic. The body doesn't expend energy to defend itself unless there's a need for it. And modern society is the worst thing. We need to trick the body into getting out of its comfort zone by doing these things we've talked about, eating the right foods, including foods that are stressed, eating less often. And as long as we have adequate nutrition, that's what we call it intermittent fasting, that allows the body to turn on these defenses without suffering long-term negative consequences. What's interesting I find is that even though we know the fridge is probably full with food, our bodies are not that smart. Our bodies don't get that message. We can trick it, trick the body into thinking, oh my goodness, the fridge is running out of food or the field or the forest is lacking in food. We better get to hunger down and survive. What are those things? You burn fat, you increase your metabolism, so you've got more energy to run around and find food. You become more alert because you've got to go find more food um, and you defend your body against insults, whether it's incoming infections or diseases from within. One way I do it is I have a standing desk. Sitting down is bad for us. You atrophy, you have less muscle, which means your hormone levels, particularly testosterone will go down You know, in pain. That's not a good thing. You need to get off your butt, stand up, even better, go for a walk, even better, go for a run or cycle to get what we call a hypoxic state going. Your body needs to suck in more oxygen and that has remarkable health benefits. Exercise isn't just beneficial for your fitness and for your vitality. It actually can stop diseases in their tracks. Exercise can slow down cancer. In fact, it can prevent up to 23% of all cancers from occurring. Um, that's true for cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has an even bigger effect on that 30% reduction just by doing moderate exercise every week, three times a week with 10 minutes. And particularly after a meal, walking after a meal gets your glucose levels to be more level, which is what you want. Well, it'll stimulate the uptake of glucose, but also it'll get your muscles moving and stimulate the production of new blood vessels. Make sure that you don't run out of oxygen later in life. And that's cool that we can trick our bodies. And it's not that hard. We just need to do the things we're talking about on this podcast. I've heard you talk before about some of the prime movers for longevity and all risk mortality. And I'd love for you to review a little bit of that for us. I think we all know that we shouldn't smoke because it's very likely that we'll die earlier. Smoking is approximately a 40% increase in the risk of ACM. What does that translate to in I'm shortening my life by 40%. No, it means at any point in time, there's a 40% greater risk that you're going to die relative to a non-smoker and Got a it. never smoker. Yeah, so it's important to distinguish. It doesn't mean your lifespan is going to be 40% less. It means at any point in time standing there, your risk of death is 40% higher. High blood pressure, it's about a 20 to 25% increase in all-cause mortality. And again, there's a confounder there because there's what's the underlying condition that leads you to that? It's, you know, profound hypertension, you know, significant type 2 diabetes that's been uncontrolled. You know, that's enormous. That's about 175% increase in ACM. So now the question is like, how do you improve? So what are the things that improve those? So if you compare low muscle mass people to high muscle mass people as they age, the low muscle mass people have about a 3x hazard ratio or 200% increase in all-cause mortality. If you look at people who are in the bottom 25% for their age, age and sex in terms of VO2 max, and you compare them to the people that are just at the 50th to 75th percentile. So you're talking about, you know, bottom quarter to the elite for a given age. Um, you're talking about 5x, wow. 400% difference in all-cause mortality. That's probably the single strongest association I've seen for any modifiable behavior. Incredible. So uh, when you say elite, these are uh, people that are running marathons at a pretty rapid clip? Not necessarily. It's just like what the VO2 max is for that. Like my VO2 max would be in the elite for my age group. Until your VO2 max is at least to the 75th percentile, 
and you're able to dead hang for at least a minute and you're able to wall sit for at least two, like we could rattle off a bunch of relatively low hanging fruit. I wish there was a rule that said like you couldn't talk about anything else.